All right, thank you all uh, for joining us. We'll get started here in just a minute as we allow people to fill into the uh, webinar room. I see a, a great audience turning out. So we'll just give it a minute or two here while the, while the audience piles in and then we'll get started with our esteemed panel talking about uh, the challenges in the semiconductor supply chain. So I see more folks coming in. So we'll just give folks a minute or two more to get to a stable audience number. And then we'll get started right here at about a minute and a half past the hour. So looks like we got a good audience. So I wanna thank everybody for attending. My name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Anson Scalia Law School. We're thrilled today to be hosting Fabricating the Future, discussing the importance of semiconductors to US national security. We have a stellar panel of experts for you here today starting right at the top with Ritu Favre. She's the Executive Vice President and GM of the Semiconductor and Electronics, the Aerospace Defense and Government and Transportation Business Units at National Instruments. She's responsible for driving growth and defining the systems, software and services capabilities required to meet the unique needs of customers in all of these markets. Ritu has over 30 years of experience in tech, including multi-semiconductor uh, positions uh, and brings a diverse outside in perspective to NI. She's a leader in the high-tech industry, she served as a CEO at Next Biometrics on the COHU Board of Directors. She's also held senior management positions at heavyweights like Microsoft, uh, sorry, pardon me, Motorola, Freescale, the other M company, uh, Freescale Semiconductor and Synaptics. When she's not traveling around the globe, Reach is inspiring and inspired by the next generation of female leaders in the semiconductor industry as a member of the Global Semiconductor Association's Women's Leadership Council. She's also an advisory board member at Microfactoring Institutes a 501c3 charitable organization delivering high-tech education programs to increase diversity and broad participation in the industry. John Newfer is another one of our panels. He's the president and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association, the voice of the chip industry for over four decades. He's been the nexus of technology, public policy, and trade for most of his career. Since joining SIA, John has led the association's policy advocacy in DC and capitals around the globe. He's also a member of the board of directors of the Semiconductor Research Corporation, world's leading nonprofit industry government academia consortium uh, in the microelectronics research space. John previously has a, has a long career in the government with seven years, over seven years at USTR in Washington, DC, two years as the deputy assistant US trade representative for the Asia Pacific uh, Economic Cooperation region uh, and preceded by over five years as deputy assistant US trade rep for Japan. And last but certainly not least, Sarah Stewart is the executive director of the Silverado Policy Accelerator. She also has two decades of experience as an international trade lawyer, policy expert, and negotiator. Immediately prior to joining Silverado, Sarah led uh, public policy efforts at Amazon on US trade policy and export control matters from 2013 to 2018. Sarah also worked at the Office of the US Trade Representative with her most recent, posi recent position being the Deputy Assistant US Trade Rep for Environment and Natural Resources. During her time at USTR, Sarah was the lead environment chapter negotiator for the US Mexico Canada trade agreement and the TTIP negotiations with the EU. So, with that, I mean, this is an amazing panel. You cannot find a better panel of folks to talk about semiconductor issues. So, let's just jump right into it. So, John, we'll start with you. Talk to us about the challenges in the, in the semiconductor supply chain and tell us what a resilient supply chain in the US would look like going forward. Oh, John, you're on mute. So being doing this for 18 months, I still can't find that mute button. Listen, it is um, the it is the word of 2020 and 2021, or the phrase, you are on mute. So so your question is, what does a, a, a resilient supply chain look like? And I, I tell you that that's the million dollar question yeah. these days. You know, th this all this whole thing got kind of started when the, when the pandemic hit and people started thinking about um, vulnerabilities and getting getting uh, medical medical products and devices and, and vaccinations and well part part of the mix there was vulnerabilities with our semiconductor supply chains and so, right, right. so so what happened is 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 um, um we were experiencing shortages across the board and we're trying to figure out well is there a way of kind of kind of mitigating against the risks for that and um we can go into it a lot more detail later but there yeah. you know the u.s government has undertaking this 100 day review of supply chains, looking for vulnerabilities. And with no surprise at all, we've actually worked very closely with the US government. We found in the chips area, there's quite a few things that need to be remedied. One of them is yeah. we, don't, we don't 
manufacture enough chips here, chips here in the US. Another one is, is the most leading edge logic chips. None of them are made here in the US. 92% uh, uh, of them are made in Taiwan and 8% uh, made in South Korea. Two, two areas where that are somewhat more prone than the US to geopolitical risk. Right. So, right. so and, and there's, a, there's a number of other areas, uh, and Ritu will get, get into this, I'm sure, in terms of workforce, where we have some, some blind spots uh, that need to be need to be addressed. Um, there's a lot of work ahead. The great thing is, is the US government is focused like a laser on helping to facil uh, facilitate um, good outcomes. Of course, yeah. we're working very closely with them. Yeah, so Ritu, you know, um, we've heard about these semiconductor supply chain shortages, right? We obviously know about supply chain challenges more directly with our experiences, as, as John points out, with PPE and pharmaceutical precursors during the pandemic. Talk to us about how semiconductors are used today and manufactured, all the places where these supply chain vulnerabilities may really be you know, raising a concern for us long-term, because we're gonna need to talk about how to solve these things. But let's talk about how these things are utilized, how they're manufactured today. Yeah, so uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about is that this particular, the semiconductor um, getting a chip to a final product is probably one of the most complicated um, methods of actually getting into this market. So if you look at semiconductor industry in total, you have electronic design automation, you have um, fab tools, assembly tools, yeah. you have the chip design and new IP creation, and then the actual wafer fab and the, the packaging assembly and test of the chips. And so as John was just describing, there's a lot of that that is still sort of in the US, but then there's yeah. a lot of that that has now, particularly the wafer fab manufacturing, and the assembly and test has largely moved sort of offshore. And as John was describing, a lot of that is over um, in Asia. Where these chips get used are in all sorts of the, the state of the art new technology. So if you look at yeah. semiconductors, it's sort of at the heart of any new technology that's coming out. So you think about 5G and 6G, you think about artificial intelligence um, and sort of these compute farms. You think about quantum computing, of course, cars. Every car now has thousands times more semiconductor content than they used to. So as we look at anything that's electronic that you are interacting with in any way, there's gonna be a semiconductor somewhere inside it. And inside the semiconductor industry, there's a huge linkage between the manufacturing and the, the actual process to make the semiconductor and yeah. the design of these chips. So as, as more of the manufacturing gets sort of separated from the design of the chips, mm -hmm. the more that that starts to become uh, a level of vulnerability. Oh, interesting. So, so I know today we still do a lot of this, the design here in the US, right? A lot of that IP starts here in the US, right? We have a lot of the tools in fact made here or at least created here. But then as you're saying, the manufacturing moves overseas, but your point is that as these two things separate more and more, that causes more problems. Can you help us understand, help the audience understand how that, how, why that is? So there's a big part of the performance, the end performance of the actual chip that is yeah. tied to the manufacturing process. And what, what has happened, I would say, until maybe the last few years is that there was always at least pilot lines where designers could check and validate. I mean, a lot of this gets done in simulation. A lot of this is getting done, call it electronically, but there's still the physical aspect as well as what happens as the chip is in use or it's it's being um, operated in the field. Yeah. And so there's a part of, at the end of the day, you have to actually see it and work with it to make sure that all of these simulations that you're doing um, actually happen in reality. There's also yeah. a lot of advanced packaging and testing. Um, and, and I worked at Motorola, as you said, in my biography for about 25 years, I was actually in a bunny suit. I worked in the wafer fab, yeah. literally doing that work and then tying it back to the design. Um, there's a, yeah. there's a huge amount of linkage. And I think the fact that these latest generation technologies are a hundred percent offshore does yeah. create a vulnerability in the space. And, and Ritu, just one, one more follow-up and then I've got a question for Sarah, but um, it, does this really, you know, we've heard a lot of talk in, in, in this space about sort of 10 nanometers and, and seven and, and, and three. Is that what you're talking about? Sort of as you move to these smaller things that have actually a, a real physical component to them, right? That's where, is that where the, some of the challenge comes if they're being manufactured elsewhere from where they're designed? Is that your point? No, so, so what John just said that, call it 10 nanometer or seven nanometer. Yeah. 
I would say that this is the first time in the in my experience where yeah. all of that manufacturing is now being done offshore. Right. Bef those prior nodes we had, we still had onshore capability in the United States. Now, a hundred percent of that has moved offshore, and that's where I'm saying that as we are looking at these advanced logic nodes, as well as a lot of the RF that gets done, um, which still does have onshore capability you start to separate from, you know, kind of the physical aspect of it. And I believe that over time that will create challenges. Yeah, great. That's really, it's really important. Um, so, um, so I know, uh, Sarah, we've talked uh, in the past uh, when I've talked about these issues, um, one of the things we've talked about is creating fab capacity, right? And I think we're going to get to John talking about what's going on with global chip shortage in, in particular. But um, uh, as we're thinking about creating more fab capacity, right? This, this uh, talk, doing what Ritu's talking about, bringing some of that manufacturing back to the U.S. Um, are there particular regulatory barriers um, uh, that companies will face in the U.S. that are not issues outside the U.S. that are more challenges here than they are elsewhere? Yeah, thanks, Jamil. I mean, I think this is a really important question, and I think it dovetails actually with the broader issue of, you know, what are the what are the conditions to, you know, producing in the U.S. compared to other countries? Yeah. And John, you know, knows this better than anybody, but there's a host of foreign government incentives that we just don't have here. And so we've created, you know, a really uneven playing field for U.S. producers or anybody producing in the U.S. So that's yeah. kind of the starting point. And then as you kind of drill down from there, there's, you know, various different pieces to that. And, you know, an obvious one being, you know, labor costs, which is right. not unique to the chip industry and is faced right. by many, many manufacturing industries. But one of the areas that we've um, that we've started to do some deeper diving on is uh, in the area of, of the environment. And we've done dozens of interviews over the last, you know, several months with various different experts who are working, you know, in the, in the semiconductor industry in various capacities and government officials. And I think you know, we've sort of come to the realization that there definitely are some regulatory barriers here in the U.S., that we're yeah. not that others are not facing, you know, in you know, especially China, but you right. know, even even in some of the other Asian countries and and potentially even the EU, and it really comes down to the fact that we have very very high standards for clean water, clean air, and this is really important, and we should not you know roll that back, and the. The companies that are producing here in the U.S., they get that. They've been, you know, meeting those standards and in some cases even exceeding those standards, but it comes at a cost. And so I think that, you know, as we think about bringing more capacity back to the United States, we should think about how do we use this moment not to... Uh, you know, not to uh, roll back the environmental protections or to ignore them, but what is the opportunity that we have here as we're doing yeah. this? And I think that there's a couple of ways that, that we could look at this. Um, you know, one is we can use um, trade agreements, trade policy, and other diplomatic yeah. relationships to try and level the playing field in some of these areas with other countries so that they are bringing up their labor and environment standards. Another, right. you know, another thing that that the U.S. government can do, and some of this was, you know, part of the the White House's recent report, is to incentivize private companies to go even beyond what the, yeah. the laws and the regulations provide. And I think a lot of them are already doing that, not just U.S. producers, but many others as well. And there's yeah. a great sustainability story to be told there that could get even better if the U.S. government wanted to help, you know, provide incentives and tax credits and other things that country so that companies could, you know, get to that next generation of cleaner technology. Yeah. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, there's a permitting process for new new projects. And again, not unique to, to chips, but one yeah. of the interesting things in the supply chain report was on critical minerals. They were calling for an interagency task force to take a look at, you know, the permitting process, among other things, 
um, for critical minerals to sort of see how can we both streamline the process and modernize it so that we yeah. can achieve the objectives there, but without doing that with uh, uh, at a at a cost to to the environment. So yeah. those are just a couple of a couple of ideas. Yeah. So John, you know, um, one of the things so Sarah's talked to us about some of the some of the barriers uh, in the U.S. Um, uh, both environmental and other regulatory standards. T you know, we control, as I understand it, forty seven percent of the global market share when it comes to semiconductors. Yet we only manufacture twelve percent. You raise the point that you know part of the challenge is in the manufacture of these high end, uh, high capability chips. Um, what can we do to increase our manufacturing capacity uh, in general in semiconductors, but also in particular, and, and help us help us think through some of the issues that Sarah raised about these environmental regs? Because you know it, it's certainly important to try and raise standards overseas and level that out, no doubt. Um, also important to, to increase permitting, but there are very real challenges we face with the environmental regs here in the U.S. Uh, if we maintain at the current level. So talk to us about some of these issues and how, you, how you're thinking about them from SIA's uh, uh, perspective. Yeah, uh, by far uh, the biggest barrier to manufacturing in the U.S. is actually incentives offered, manufacturing incentives offered overseas by competing countries. We had the Boston Consulting Group uh, work up a really great uh, supply chain uh, report recently, and, and it identified that as by far and away the, the biggest barrier. What, what's, what's happened decades ago is competing countries decided they took the strategic decision to uh, uh, incentivize manufacturing in their countries with massive incentives. Some of them tax incentives, sometimes grants, all sorts of things. Yeah. We Essentially have not, industrial policy for semiconductors, but, but decades ago to get ahead of us. So they decided to do that. And as a result, uh, in 1990, we were manufacturing 37% of the world's semiconductors. Yeah. Today, it's 12%. 12 now, there's a lot of factors that went into that, but the biggest one were these government incentives. So if, if we're going to get back into the game, we absolutely need to have our government step in and offer similar incentives because those governments are not going to change their policies. Yeah. So we're going to have to get in the game with 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 greater incentives. Yeah, so there's been a lot of talk about that, right? And we saw the, the US ICA, right, uh, uh, passed by the Senate on June 8th, right? Um, how do you see that as being the right approach to motivating domestic investment here, John? And, and then I'm coming to you too, because I know that part of the key issue is, is the workforce that we have to do this work here in the US and the like. But John, talk to me about the US ICA um, and whether that creates the right kind of incentive structure you're talking about if there's more that needs to be done we had the chips hack that was a, a significant pieces of that were passed in, in the nda talks about 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 this exact issue of incentives and and how how what we're doing now we're trying to do with chips in USIC. what does that how does that relate to what so, foreign countries are doing overseas yeah yeah so jamil um washington loves its acronyms acronyms and USIC is now being called USICA. oh so, USICA. all right all right thank, yes, thank you for uh, the uh so there we go yeah so heard so, it here first people USICA. There we go. Um, USICA is, um, it, it, it includes, it's, it's, a, it's a sweeping um, uh, bill that, 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 that tries to, tries to uh, beef up uh, uh, federal, federal research um, uh, uh, dollars uh, yeah. across the board, National Science Foundation, DOE, DOD. But a key piece of this legislation is $52 billion in manufacturing incentives and research investments. Um, Rita yeah, was yeah. talking about these things needing to kind of stay together and, 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 the, bill, and the bill does that. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very important step for us. For us. It's, uh, but we, this is a marathon we're running. We're, I was speaking earlier uh, uh, on another panel and this came up as being, being a kind of a marathon and it is. So it's a great first step um, to, to get us started. Just so, $52 billion, about $42 billion, if it gets through the house, right. we'll go towards manufacturing incentives. If you're building a leading edge logic fab, yep. about $30 billion, just to give you a sense of the kind of money we're talking about in our industry. Now, $40 billion you know, would really help because because uh, the government would chip in a small portion and the and, and private sector would a chip in the, the lion's share. But but so it's a great start. We'd also like to see uh, an investment tax credit. So if you're yes. building a fab or 
buying equipment that, that, which is not small stuff, right, Ritu? And these right. are machines that are tens of millions of dollars. Uh, then you th th then you get a bit of a tax break. Um, and so th the that would be a kind of a longer term enduring solution if, to put that in, into the tax system. Yeah. So so we're we're very encouraged. I mean, we kind of pinch ourselves. This whole idea started getting cooked up last spring, and it got authorized earlier in the year. And now the Senate has appropriated money for this, and it's moving to the House which is gonna be, you know, we're, we're optimistic, we'll get something out of that. So, so just, to, just, just the bottom line is, it's, it's a great, it's a great, very important step forward for us. Yeah, yeah. So Ritu, you know, you've, uh, you lead three business units uh, at a major player in the space at NI, right? Across, you know, the most important spectra of, of US national security and defense uh, use of semiconductors. Um, but you've also been out there in the field and, and done this stuff, as you said, in, in the bunny suit at, at Motorola, not Microsoft, um, and uh, and you know one of the key issues that we've heard about, you know, in the discussion about semiconductors, besides rare earth metals and besides uh, manufacturing capabilities and incentives uh, of of of, uh, of foreign countries, um, is this issue about STEM graduates, right? And we know this is a larger problem in the United States, and we've had so many conversations about the challenges we face in STEM. How can we, you know, how can we invest in STEM? How can we incentivize? Uh, you know, STEM graduates to uh, people to follow this path and really, and really make that happen quickly. I mean, the, the, the time from, you know, from sort of, you know, creating these students and getting them to graduate school to where we need them to be, to do the kind of advanced manufacturing that John is talking about, the EDA, the, the semi, the chip design that you're talking about and the manufacturing, it's a long process. Is there, what is the, what is the best way to move down that road in your mind? Yeah, so one thing I would say is um, I have a bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering from Arizona State University. So as a STEM graduate, I can definitely say um, this is a complex problem, as is, is, yeah. is very obvious. Um, I would say there's a few things that we can do. The first thing is we have to increase the uh, pipeline of qualified candidates in the United States. We got to start early. And as you said, how do we do this very quickly? There's a part that's, you know, how do you incentivize people to, to, you know, go into these sorts of degrees? Part of it is you've got to start really, really early, um, really creating a culturally diverse network of STEM role models for children, um, yeah. really, really starting again, starting early. So we know that what students hear early in their life reverberates throughout the rest of their life. I think we should have uh, create and fund programs that expose them to coding, engineering, and math. And the minute I think that people hear things like that, their brains shut off because it's like, oh my God, yeah. engineering and math. But really getting hands-on in really fun ways. I do think there's still a lot of a stigma that science, math, and engineering is really for nerds and it's hard. And, and we've really got to make it look a lot more fun. Uh, yeah. I don't think we should just focus on resource schools. We know that children in underserved schools are, failing a, are facing a lot of challenges. Even if STEM, STEM is valued in the districts, what we're finding is the focus tends to be in high school rather than starting back in elementary and middle school. This is where a lot of this actually, this mindset develops. So um, you're I talking, think, you're talking K through six even, you're not even talking, you know, high school, we're talking earlier than that. Oh yeah, I think you gotta start back in, you know, back in elementary. And again, this is where that yeah. stigma kind of forms is, you know, math is hard. And I will tell you, I am a product of the US public school education system. I came all the way through. Um, yeah. there's, there are reasons why it was call it somewhat even harder being a female, because mm -hmm. the minute that you're in some of these math classes, it's like, oh, don't worry about that. You don't need to do that. And so you, you, we need to be thinking about all the way back through kindergarten, all the way through again, that's not going to yeah. solve the problem today, but I think it is something that we've got to be thinking about. Um, I do think in Yusika, as uh, John said, there are provisions for STEM and yeah. STEM diversity programs, um, K through 12. And I think yeah. this is really, really important. NI is actually partnering with FIRST Robotics in this area. So awesome. we are extremely committed to um, yeah. helping get people into these STEM kinds of programs. Make sure, And then the other big thing I would talk about is high school yeah. immigration policies. How do we have the US keep the best and the brightest? When I was in yeah. graduate school, the bulk of my fellow graduate students were, from, were international students. At that yeah. time, people would go into the pipeline of, you know, particularly semiconductor. I was in Phoenix. 
Intel and Motorola were big fab providers there. There was a direct pipeline from graduate school into these companies. Today, right. what is happening is a lot of these students go back to their home countries and right. they find these jobs there. So I really think in incentivizing these graduates to stay in the United States yeah. would also expand our STEM pipeline. No, it, it, it really is kind of crazy, right? We, we talk about having the best higher education system in the world, right? A lot of people are attracted here because of our higher education system. And then we take these graduates, we make them into stellar you know, designers and, 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 and fabricators of chips. And we say, you must now go home, right? We can't yeah. you can do whatever you want, but you can't stay here, right? It makes little sense. Um, you know, it, it seems crazy. And the problem is, I think one of the challenges is this particular issue gets lost in the larger debate about immigration, right? And we lose the economic benefit that we get because it becomes politicized, right? I think that's the real challenge here. Um, I, have a, I have a question though for that I want to follow up on. You made a point about um, uh, this sort of dynamic in K through six where, you know, um, and, and, and even K through 12, where uh, people are told, look, STEM is for nerds, math is for nerds. And you particularly highlighted uh, sort of the, the the relation between that narrative and women. How you know how do we break that cycle? Are we have we have we you know as a society right? Women seem to be in a, in a much more extensive way in the workforce at higher levels at executive levels. You're an example of that yourself. Sarah's an example of that. But help us understand how we are we are we still facing this challenge in K through six and K through twelve? And if so, what is how do we break that advantage? Is it simply a matter of the right kind of mentors, the right kind of demonstrating that people can succeed in the industry, or is there a more sort of fundamental shift we need to make at that K through six level in your mind? Yeah, so um, th this is an area I'm extremely passionate about. So the one thing that I would say for sure is it's definitely a statistical um, fact that only tw the, the number of women that have been going into engineering has stayed very flat over the past 20 years. So the, 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 the number of women going into engineering is about 20% over the past 20 years. And then I'm gonna ask people to do a little bit of math. During this time, what we find is about 30% of the women that go into engineering school switch out of um, an engineering program. And then after that, 20 years later, only 30% of the women that earned bachelor's degrees in math or, or engineering or science are still in that industry. So if you do all of that math, there's only about 6% of women that have stayed in an engineering field Jeez. 20 years after graduating college. There are a lot of um, kind of things that, that need to be thought through here. And this is where the K through six piece becomes really important. One right. thing I will say at NI is we have something called changing the face of engineering. And we're mm -hmm. really looking to show what matters is that when you look around that you see people that look somewhat like you. What, you, what we found through a McKinsey study is that diversity really does matter for business. And so you need to have a diverse workforce. So not mm. only do you have to get more people in the United States going into STEM um, education, but you need a diverse workforce to go into STEM education. Yeah. What, what, I've, um, what we've done here at NI, and I think this is something that we've gotta be thinking about is really putting goals around these initiatives. So first we have to say, okay, how do you get K through 12 kids to even go into engineering? That was sort of the part that I was talking about before. Yeah. Once you bring people into the workforce, you need to have them feel like they're included and there's, there's sort of a career path. And so yeah. as of January, 2021 at NI, we have about 32% of our population is female. Our goal is to get to 50%. Wow. We've announced two strategic partnerships with Code to College and Project Lead the Way. And then last week we announced grants to six organizations just really focusing on diversity and equity in STEM education. Yeah. Um, and so I think the biggest thing that I would say in this area is get people excited young. Don't make it look like it's so hard as they're coming right. in then through engineering school, provide female mentors as they're going through that yeah. process. It's, it's a very, very hard degree. And then yeah. once women and, um, and diverse populations get into the workforce, have people that look somewhat like you as yeah. you're kind of going up through the, through the ranks. Yeah. yeah, so it's not just that sort of break that barrier at the, at the first stage and get people interested. It's, it's sustain that interest and really create that mentorship sponsorship pipeline yeah. Um, and, and really ensuring that you're retaining these people and keeping them in the, not just in your organization, but in the field over the long run. Interesting. Yeah. And I will tell yeah. you one other thing, my daughter, so I went through the U.S. public school system. My daughter has gone through the U.S. public school system. She was told every step of the way, 
You don't need to do math. Math isn't important. And I will tell you because of her very mean mother, she's going to be pursuing a right. PhD in environmental science because every step of the way yeah. I was saying, no, you can do it. You should do it. And, and that's, that's what needs to happen sort of across the board. I mean, that's astounding in the modern era. I mean, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing to hear that. Um, so Sarah, you know, let's talk about, so the one I, I, if you, if you want to weigh in on this issue, I think, I think it's an important question. Um, if you have thoughts on STEM and, and, and diversity, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But I do also want to ask you about, you know, your experience at USTR and how, and how that might shape some of these, uh, some of these issues. So in addition to you, SICA, um, what other, what other policies in your mind could the Biden administration adopt uh, to address the resistance from supply chain? Is there, is there something we can do? You had mentioned uh, uh, this idea of, of using our international agreements to, to raise the standards overseas. So I heard that. Other things that we could do, um, Sarah, in, in this space. So let's start on STEM and then let's come over to uh, this issue of, 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 uh, of additional uh, supply chain incentives or, or, or methods through, our, uh, through our, our trade agreements. Sarah? Perfect. Well, first of all, Ritu, thank you so much for your leadership on this issue. I have a six-year-old daughter you know, I'm, I'm with you. We need to be, you know, pounding the pavement that this is an area that is not just, you know, uh, going to be a worthwhile career, but that's really, really interesting and fulfilling. And I know, you know, in my time in the private sector, there was definitely programs that tried to help get the kids, you know, excited robotics camps and coding camps and things like that. I think it's should be mandatory in school, public and private, that kids are learning about STEM and learning the practical applications so that it's not just this, oh, that's too scary and I don't know how to do that, but this is what you need to learn in order to ha have a video game, in order to you know, have, a, a, have a smartphone. They need to understand yeah. you know, sort of the tangible applications that come with that. And so I really, um, I really applaud the work that you're doing, Ritu, and, and we hope to do some 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 work uh, through Silverado as well. On the trade question, um, you know, I think that this is a really important one. I think that trade agreements and trade policy, um, not a panacea for everything, but yeah. certainly <laughs> certainly a major tool in my experience to do a lot of things because you're working with partners who typically are like-minded on a range of issues where you have a deep, you know, allied partnership that, you know, typically runs from both the economic also to the strategic. So there's a lot yeah. of room to use these, these, these agreements in this, in this policy. I think, you know, I touched on one area already, which is the leveling the playing field which you know, I think is a really important one because it's not just labor and environment, it's the cross the range of issues, whether it's IP enforcement and IP theft, whether it's government subsidies that are creating all sorts of distortions in our markets. You know, trade is one way to really work with other partners to sort of right. even things out. And then hopefully that has a domino effect. Um, and that other countries are then sort of, you know, uh, wanting to wanting to be a part of that. But then I think, you know, sort of um, more more narrowly for, you know, the issue the issue at hand. Yeah. We were, you know, at Silverado, we were thinking about, you know, what are the ways that USTR could be more involved on some of these supply chain issues for all the reasons that I just stated. And so we really welcomed yeah. the establishment of the USTR strike force. Um, mm -hmm. That was announced along with the the supply chain review, and I think you know there's lawyers deploying of... to the field. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. This might be somebody's nightmare, but I think it right. could be a good thing. Um, you know, there's not a lot of uh, public information yet about what that looks like, but yeah. I think that there's there's a few ways that the strike force um, could be could be deployed. Um, so first of all, I think before we do anything, we need to do sort of a, uh, a, a deep analysis, maybe a Venn diagram that looks mm -hmm. across, you know, all of our partners that we have FTAs or TIFAs or other trade yeah. arrangements with, not just our World Trade Organization partners. And then okay. we need to map that out to, you know, 
when you look at a semiconductors, for example, supply chain, which of those partners have aspects of the supply chain, you know, yep. in their, with domestic capacity, which ones yep. are looking for more domestic capacity, and then sort of see, you know, can you create, you know, more diversification along the supply chain by, you know, pushing, pushing on it with, with those partners and, and coordinating and, yeah. and, and yeah. having, um, you know, more of a, more of a harmonized view. Then I think, you know, it's important to um, think about once you identify those partners, what do, what do you do next? Do yeah. you modify existing agreements? Do you negotiate new ones? I think it could be a combination. I think yeah. that there's also room, you know, for sectoral supply chain agreements. And I think, you know, USTR would work with an interagency on something like this. And I would see it as a two-pronged approach. I think that there would be an offensive part of this that mm -hmm. would be trying to figure out, you know, are there tariffs that could be lowered among these, the, the, the partner countries right. that would, you know, ease, ease the flow of, of materials, equipment, right. you know, other right. things in the supply chain. Make that chain. supply chain move faster. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but there also may be, you know, preferential access to, you know, where you are in the queue with some of mm. these, with some of these partners for various pieces of the, of the supply chain. So yeah. I think, you know, you've got to look at, you've got to look at that, but then you've also got to think about, I'm doing this supply chain agreement with, with one of my part, with one of my trading partners, what are the defensive things that we can work on together? And I mm. think that this is really critical because yeah. as the U.S. is putting all of this money and investment into building capacity at home, we cannot let it just walk right back out the back door because of IP theft, because of- right you know, uh, we, that we haven't taken the right measures for technology transfer and other things. So we have got to be working with our partner, with our training partners yeah. and with our allies on coordinating on that. And yeah. I will say one last thing, because, you know, in, in, in previous roles, I worked a lot on export controls. And yeah. when we do, when we impose export controls, just as the U.S., and we're not working with our partners on it, we're really hurting ourselves. We've got to immediately, in my mind, get to the table with our partners so that we can make that type of tool more effective yeah. and, and, and really, you know, and, and really tighten that up so that it's to our advantage and not to our disadvantage. Yeah. So, so John, I, I do have a question for you, but I want to let the audience remind the audience that in about 10 minutes or so, we're going to be taking questions from the audience. So if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, function there. Uh, we'll take those in about, in about 10, 12 minutes. Um, so John, you know, um, uh, one of the things Sarah talked about is, is this idea of using trade agreements to better coordinate with our partners, sort of lubricate that supply chain, uh, make it function better through lowering of trade barriers, um, and also coordinating on export controls, the extent that we're going to impose those, uh, make sure it's not just us doing it unilaterally, but this multilateral construct where we can get our allies on board um, in order to sort of protect against uh, the threats that are coming from overseas um, and protect this IP leakage. Um, one of the things I'm interested to talk about, though, is, you know, we, we, you mentioned earlier in your conversation this, the 100-day the, the report coming out of the critical supply chain review. Any big takeaways from that that we haven't talked about yet? We, I know that there was some discussion of STEM in there, some discussion of, of uh, of the need to invest, we've talked about uh, we've talked about um, uh, the trade agreements piece. Are there any additional uh, pieces of the of the hundred day report that we ought to be thinking about and really focusing on here, John? And I think you're on mute. There we go again. I I think we hit uh, hit all the high points on on that review. It, it's a yeah. sprawling report, two hundred fifty pages, sixty pages on semiconductors alone. A lot of fabulous stuff in it, but I think we hit the big stuff. I want to go back, respond to a couple of things that were said by, by, by Ritu and Sarah. Um, Ritu, you had some awesome figures and numbers uh, on, on the workforce question. Um, just I want to throw a couple of things out. One is uh, today, uh, only one in four students in postgraduate work in uh, uh, computer science and electrical engineering are native born. The rest of them are from abroad, just to show what's going on in the schools now. And the and the other very interesting data point is, while we're struggling, 
to get kids into STEM, others are slingshotting ahead. I, I think we all know the number of STEM degrees coming out of China, but in Korea, there is a high school dedicated to semiconductors. There's a semiconductor high school in Korea. We, we don't have anything like that. So I think, I think we absolutely have to think big here. Um, totally with Ritu on that. Uh, the other thing, and 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 uh, it, an answer to your question, Jamil, and and, and Sarah raises export controls. Yeah. So export controls done unilaterally are, are really kind of dumb. I mean, yeah. the the in the case of semiconductor industry, while we control about forty seven percent of the global market, we're 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 the big player. There's all sorts of other players out there that produce lots of semiconductors. Taiwan produces twenty percent of semiconductors. Korea produces another twenty percent. And so if we uh, control technologies going say to China um, and those other countries don't control technologies going, semiconductor technologies going to China, well, we just have a great transfer of wealth from us to our competitors overseas. So Sarah's absolutely correct. When you're doing export controls, you absolutely have to have collaboration with partners because we're not the only ones in business out there. So, so the other thing is, um, and Sarah touched on this on tariffs. In some ways, I think that there's a lot of things we can do, but we, can, we should also go back to the basics. For semiconductors, 80% of our customers are overseas. We have yeah. the most sophisticated supply chains for advanced manufacturing. And we absolutely rely on those supply chains and the free flow of goods across borders. Tariffs are kind of the first thing we get hit with. And, and, and if you get tariffs going in and, and the parts and pieces are constantly moving across borders, every time you're moving across the border, it's 3%, 4%, 5%. Adding the cost, yeah. It really starts adding up. So in the WTO, there's this beautiful agreement called the Information Technology Agreement that comes from the 1990s. I see uh, Sarah nodding her head there. Yep, she knows all about it. And, and it, it, was a, it was a kind of a breakthrough agreement, a, they call it a sectoral agreement it was, it was a, yep. for, for tech. And, it, and some smart folks back there said, if we want to really kind of um, juice economic growth, let's get tech products into the hands of everybody at affordable prices. Yeah. So yeah. tariffs were not just reduced, eliminated on a wide range of tech products, like, like computers and computer screens, things like that. So five years ago, we updated that and doubled the trade covered. And so uh, just captured a whole, whole new range of products. We need to do that again. Things that are not included are um, batteries for electric vehicles, charger stations for electric vehicles, satellites, which are critical for communication and bridging the, the, the digital divide. This could be a very kind of simple, clean way to use trade policy to really kind of address uh, a lot of the problems we're talking about here today. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah so Sarah, so the th thoughts on thoughts on 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 how to utilize the the capability that we developed back in the '90s um, to really uh, juice this. Is John has John got it right? Additional ideas uh, in that space from your end. I mean, look, I, I think John has it right 100%. You know, you start with ITA, you get those tariffs lowered. I mean, that's on a multilateral basis. So you're yeah. getting like kind of like, you know, one foul swoop there. Um, but I think that, you know, what I was suggesting would be on top of that. Um, yeah. It would be, you know, going into right. bilateral and regional agreements where, you know, you're not sort of stuck at the lowest common denominator for lack of a better, you know, way of describing multilateral agreements. And you're able to kind of even push even further, especially with like-minded partners. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, Ritu, one of the, um, one of the uh, challenges we've faced in this space is uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, the concentration and the national security implications of DOD's reliance on overseas uh, semiconductors, particularly these, these highly advanced semiconductors that, that John was talking about. And you manage an entire BU uh, that focuses on uh, the aerospace defense and government sectors. Um, you know, how concerned should we be about uh, our current supply chain vulnerabilities when it comes to, in particular, uh, the defense complex? 
Yeah, so one thing that I would say in this area is the, the defense industry has what's kind of called trusted foundries. And a lot of that is onshore in the United States. And those are, as we talked about before, the advanced logic nodes have moved offshore. So a lot of the capability that the DOD is able to get access to is pretty far behind the, you know, sort of the state of the art in semiconductor. Yeah. Um, the other piece that I would say is that it's, we have to make sure that all these components that they do get from, um, you know, kind of trusted sources are free from any vulnerabilities that are intru introduced in the supply chain. So if you think about it again, you have the, the, the design part, you have the manufacturing piece, and you've got to make sure that this is all really, uh, that there wasn't a vulnerability that was introduced along the supply chain. And so yeah. in, the, in the past, again, it's been, let's go to a trusted foundry and a trusted geography. But now with a lot of what's happening, um, with a lot of this being offshore, there is a real national security implication. And so one yeah. of the things that NI has been doing is really one of the ways that you can string this together, because it does take a long time to build new factories, um, to get yeah. all of that done. One of the things that we've been doing with the recent acquisition of Optimal Plus is really looking at the data. And so being able to mm -hmm. gather, normalize and analyze chip level data along the entire supply chain from chip fab through final assembly and into the, the defense contractor, what, what needs to happen, I believe, is that there needs to be a zero trust philosophy applied to all yeah. of this hardware so that you can make sure that there's quantifiable assurance of the security of that semiconductor. NI today deploys this technology into the commercial sector. We're actually helping our customers collect data on billions of chips um, yeah. in existing foundries and OSATs. And we're exploring ways on how to, in, to demonstrate this capability to the DOD to help inform their policy on how to meet this modernization and security yeah. challenge. So to yeah. get a, just a little bit technical, chips generate a lot of data as they're tested along the supply chain, thousands of test measurements of voltage, frequency, temperature, current. When you aggregate and normalize and analyze all of that, it can be sort of a DNA profile or almost a fingerprint of a chip. Interesting. And the solution can provide then chip designers a window into the data along the entire hmm. supply chain so that you can find anomalies and quantifiably assure that the chip did not yeah. pick up vulnerabilities. So one piece is, bringing this capability back on shore so that we can have right. these trusted um, foundries. And the other is to have this um, data along this entire workflow and be able to look at that signature to make sure that what, what the, the DOD receives is really what they had thought they were receiving. Yeah, interesting. So I think, so, so I'm hearing your point right. Um, we, we still need to focus on this issue of bringing, bringing domestic production back, but in the interim period, as we're building the long lead time that it takes to build these facilities and we're continuing to acquire chips from overseas, we need to ensure that the entire supply chain uh, can be sort of vetted and assured along the way. And that there are actually ways to measure the signatures coming off of chips um, in a way that can assure that what, you're, what, you've, what you've contracted for is what you're getting on top of being modified in a way that's potentially problematic along the way in a way that you can really ensure that what you've asked for is what you're getting. Is that, am I hearing that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, again, with, with this combination of voltage and temperature and currents yeah. that you're measuring, if you can make sure that you are kind of collecting that signature along the way, as you're delivering these chips, you could be delivering this, this sort of data profile and ensuring that what you've received is what was actually built along the supply chain. Yeah. Terrific, terrific. Well, you know, I think I'm going to go to questions from the audience. I see we've got we've got nine questions out there already, and so, uh, folks, if you have questions, go ahead and throw them in there. But I've got I've got a number here, uh, so I'll just jump right in. Um, so, John, I'll start with you. Um, you know, in your mind, uh, Brian McLaughlin asks, um, how much should policy and public investment focus on building and addressing current capacity as opposed to sort of looking at future leadership in areas like quantum? What's the right balance between today's technologies, what we need today, both commodity manufacturing, advanced manufacturing? And how much of it, how much of that effort should be put in, and that and that sort of incentivization over in quantum and leading edge technologies? Yeah, all, all, all of the above. Um, yeah. um, I, I think what we're finding is if you look at some of our competitors abroad, in, in China, for example, um, there they've moved very briskly into AI and 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 are very on top of AI, and 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 we we, we just can't let that let that slip. So it has to be has to be across across the board. Uh, one thing one thing I want to go back to is you know we, we talk about bringing uh, manufacturing back here 
we're yeah. not bringing anything back. I mean, the mm -hmm. the fabs that are built overseas and the, and, and those those manufacturing facilities, they're billion dollar investments. What we're talking about is there's going to be there's going to be a massive explosion of demand for chips. Um, uh, Boston Consulting Group projected over the next 10 years, 56% growth in, in capacity demand over the next 10 years. That, that's massive. It's responding to this, this huge growth of, of demand for chips for your iPhone, for your, your pacemaker, for your 5G, yeah. your, your quantum. So, so we need to make sure that more of those fabs that are built are, mm -hmm. are the new ones are built here. So we're talking about right. new capacity coming online. That's right. what we're focused on. And frankly, right. that's the stuff, a lot of that stuff is going to be used for some of these more exotic. Um, Advanced. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. And, um, and, so, you know, so, and, and so just one yeah. other thing. Yeah, no, please, please. Uh, if if we, we also looked at what would the world look like if we had balkanized supply chains for semiconductors? Well, kind of everyone had it their their own their own domestic supply chain. Their own domestic now, sort of vertically integrated. The whole thing. Chain. The whole yeah. thing. Now, the the yeah. Chinese have said they want to do that themselves. Right. That's kind of problematic. But so so we looked at what will what would it look right. like if the world were like that? If if everything yeah. was decoupled, well, it would cost a trillion dollars. It would take right. five to ten years to pull off, and it would drive the price of chips up thirty five to sixty five percent. Yeah. So. That's just not what we're talking not about. We're, yeah. we're talking about some rebalancing here that's sensible, to, uh, um, addresses our main vulnerabilities and, and, and yeah, not yeah. some big uh, reshoring uh, undertaking. That, yeah. that, 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 that's just not in the cards. So, so Sarah, you know, one of the things you had talked about was this issue of environmental standards and like and, and the, the ability we might have to meet them. James Birchfield, um, uh, asked about, you know, the U.S. has had technologies that are previously developed, um, particularly in processing and refining of rare earths uh, and the likes that can help firms meet American uh, environmental safety standards. His, 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 his view is that until recently, a lot of these have been sort of shelved because uh, we've, you know, there's a lower cost uh, uh, in overseas production. But as we look to sort of, you know, bring, not bring some of this back, it's a John's point, uh, but to, to create a new uh, capabilities to, to, to build here in the U.S., um, it, does it make sense to incentivize bringing these technologies that might help us meet the American environmental standards off the shelf and utilize those? Is there is there a way to incentivize those? Are you are you, are you have you have you looked at that issue? Yeah, I mean that's that's part of what we're what we're thinking about. I mean, I think that yeah. there's this is a really ripe issue because there's a huge focus right now, um, you know, outside of the supply chain review uh, from the Biden administration in particular, um, but some in Congress as well on what are we going to do to promote clean energy? What are we going to do, you know, to, you know, uh, to, to modernize our electrical grid and, and, and many other things. And so this is coming up as part of the infrastructure package and, and many other conversations. And I think, you know, we've got to be thinking about, we've got to be thinking about this holistically. Um, and, you know, at the same time that, you know, it, you know, we're, we're creating, you know, more capacity for chips. Those chips are then going to be powering some of these, you know, products that are going to be helping with the climate. And so it's yeah. kind of like cycle that you have. So yeah, we should be, we should be thinking through, you know, um, previously shelved policies and technologies to, to help with all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Ritu, um, you know, you and I were talking a little bit earlier about this, uh, this issue of DOD and, and the national security implications of this, uh, of the supply chain vulnerabilities. Um, one of our guests asks, um, whether um, how how the intelligence community, DOD, and 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 in particular people who manage private sector critical infrastructure, how can they really evaluate the risk of using computers, uh, satellites, power generating devices? I mean, you name it, right? All the all the things that you mentioned earlier that use semiconductors um, when they've got chips that are made abroad, right? That may not have gone through the testing process and the sort of signature based uh, vetting process that you described. How should they evaluate that risk? Um, and assuming that they identify some significant risk, 
is the right answer rip and replace? I mean, do we go in and, and, and take this equipment out or, or pull the semi? I mean, I can't even even imagine how this would work, right? Either pulling that equipment out, much less going in and ripping the semiconductors out and replacing those. I don't, I don't see it as a viable theory, but is, is there a, what do we, how do we evaluate that risk? And, and what, if anything, if we do identify risk, can be done about it? So I would first say that that's um, somewhat upstream from the, the place that I would be looking at. I mean, I yeah. think it's really, really important to look at the semiconductor piece of it. I mean, there have been some stories about um, chips that have been put on boards that may have some level of vulnerability. I do think- A lot of questions about those stories, right? Those stories have been highly debated, right? Whether there's validity of those. So it's a hot topic of discussion for the last two years, in fact, right? Yeah, so I, I mean, I would just, I would take it right back to the very beginning of the, the heart of where some of this um, ends up, where you can see quite a bit of it is in the semiconductor chip and in the manufacturing itself. Yeah. In terms of what happens upstream from that, I don't know that I can make a lot of comment on that, but I yeah. do think um, securing the semiconductor part and securing um, sort of that digital signature throughout the process, I think that's probably a really key area that we have to continue to focus on. Yeah, that's, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, you know, uh, John, uh, there's uh, Michael Jeffrey asks, um, is there, um, you know, you talked about this need for the for this this tax uh, tax investment tax credit, right? Uh, and Michael Jeffroy um, uh, asks, um, what is the resistance? One of our SI fellows, what's the resistance on the Hill to to getting these tax incentives in place uh, to get industry back to the U.S.? We've been talking about it, we heard about it, you know, in uh, in in the discussions um, uh, as we were looking at the NDAA, it didn't make it in there. Right, uh, it was discussed for Usika. It looks like there's some challenge there. Why, why hasn't, why hasn't the Hill moved forward in your mind on this issue? And is there a way to kickstart that thing? It seems to me that would be a very productive uh, step forward, but, but, but it doesn't seem like we're getting that to move. What's, what's going on there in your mind? Well, actually, I, I think there may be some movement very soon on that on the Hill. Ah, uh, all right, you all heard it here first. Well, we're, 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 we're hopeful. We're hopeful on that. But you know, you know, anytime you're dealing in tax policy, you're you're part of a, a larger ethos. Yeah. And you know, we just we just went through a major tax reform in 2017, and whatever happens going forward is going to be a response to that, uh, is to, to some degree. And you know, um, uh, I, I guess people ask, our industry is is thriving, right? Our our industry yeah. is 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 just doing really great right now. Um, so, so wh wh why does it need uh, uh, any kind of tax incentives? Well, if you look around the world, um, we're largely at, at a disadvantage when, when you look at tax yeah. policy. So it, it's really to keep the global playing field level. That, 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 yeah. That's the essence of it. Yeah, we got to get in there. I got it. Makes sense. Um, so, Rito, I want to come back to you on a STEM question because I've, I've got a, one that I think is going to be a little controversial, but I'm interested in your thoughts on it. So Charles Rodriguez asked, um, you know, in, in, in encouraging students to pursue STEM, is there value, particularly women, as you talked about, is there value in all girl study cohorts? Or, I mean, do mixed gender classrooms incentivize or, or disincentivize the kind of, you know, things we want to promote when it comes to STEM? Do you have a thought on that? And, and if you don't have a view, that's fine. I'm just, it, it was an interesting question. I thought it might, I thought it might be something that might generate some, some discussion. No, no, I, I definitely have a view. I think the one thing I would say there is maybe there would be a short-term impact, but eventually, mm -hmm you have to work with everybody. And yeah. so there's the biggest piece that I see that's critical is the way teachers are teaching um, girls in particular, mm -hmm. as well as the experience in the classroom. And I think the way that I've approached it, at least with my own child, is yeah. as she comes home and says, hey, I heard this and that, it's immediately kind of mediating through that. I do think yeah. having role models and having female role models and mentors, I think is honestly the most important thing. I don't think that you're ever gonna to get to a place where you can have all women or all underrepresented right. minorities or all, I mean, we live in a, a diverse society and yeah. that is the strength of, um, of innovating is yeah. having that diversity. And so, yes, maybe there's a little bit um, that would be interesting if it's all girls, but I do think that you have to make it more just acceptable to be in math and science, yeah. whether you're yeah. girls or boys or kind of yeah. the whole entire population. Yeah, and you have to break that conversation at this idea that it's it's not important or it's not for you, right? That only happens and probably happens more in those mixed gender classrooms. And so we've got to break it break it down there if we're going to create a long-term solution, I think is what I'm That's hearing right. from you. That's yeah. Right. Um, uh, so we've got time for one more question, but Sarah, it's, we've got one minute, so I'm going to keep it short. 
Um, there's a lot of high level plans. Jacob Schenker asks about, um, you know, strengthening semiconductors, building these fabs. It's a long term solution, though, as we all talked about, right? What could we do? If you had one thing you could do in the short term, Sarah, last answer, what would it be? Um, immediately start partnering up with, uh, with allies to right. help, help diversify things. Help diversify awesome. Ally sector. partnerships. All right. Partnership. Well, listen, uh, partnership. Got it. Well, John, Ritu, Sarah, thank you for being here with us. Audience, thank you for being here with us today. It's a great conversation. Uh, please join us for upcoming events, questions from quarantine, um, uh, order up, uh, examining recent executive orders in cybersecurity on June 18th, and NASDAQ NICAP with General Petraeus on July 1st. You heard it here first, NSI's got General Petraeus, July 1st, be us there. Don't forget to look for us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, we're out there. Sarah Silverado, Policy Accelerator, SIA, John Newfer, and NI, Ritu. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks Thank so much. So great much. panel, Jamil. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.